I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Fred Shabesta is best known for co-founding one of the world's leading comparison websites, Finder.com. He's an award-winning business leader, serial entrepreneur, and active member of the startup and blockchain communities. So, Fred, mate, first things first, what's it like with all that money? Well, I don't actually have the money. It's, ah, it's, um, on, it's on paper. It's on paper. <laughs> but does it make you feel good when you read the articles about how loaded you are? You know, I think um, I think it's a tribute to you know my co-founder joining me on this it's just journey, Frank. Frank, yeah, yep. on this um, you know to take a bet and a like that in for his life. I think you know that's, that's a big career risk and a life risk. So I think it's a tribute to him, and you know, obviously he did he did well out of that as well. And um, you know, I think it's also a tribute to the team. Like they're just incredible crew at Finder. Um, but I, you know, I sort of I'm carrying on. Yeah. Doesn't change day to day life. You still got to sit down to go to the loo, as my dad used to say. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm just, um, you know, I don't have a big expensive hab- hobbies or habits or things like that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm. I like investing in the stock market, and that's hurt me a lot. So, um, but apart from that, um, <laughs> I buy a lot of Bitcoin, and that's down as well. Um, so I don't know. You know, those things are where I tend to invest for the future otherwise I, I you know i live a you know relatively you know a life like everyone else yeah well listen staying on the theme of money we're going to move to your first choice which is traditionally the film uh, and you have chosen the brad pitt 2011 film moneyball why i love that movie it's about finding peculiar and quirky individuals which stack together um, to make an incredible crew. An inc- you know, obviously the A's didn't win that year, um, but the idea of it, it ma- I cried. Well, the first time I watched that, I, I was in an aeroplane. I think you cry more often in an aeroplane as well. Um, at least 11 times. It just broke me so many different moments in that. And I think because I connected with the idea of being different and that being okay, and in fact celebrating that. And I think that's what that movie taught us right and 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 i think there's a there's a there's a real um aspect of that in my life you know i've always done things differently um i've i've hired people that you know you wouldn't normally hire people would not hire those people and i think nah they've got a real greatness inside them that just needs to be unlocked for people who haven't seen the film, uh, the, the central premise, because I, I agree, I think it's a sensational film and a sensational sort of moral to it, is that they have a non-subjective view of hiring talent. So people that other people would pass up, they hire, and the next season they went on and were wildly successful. They didn't win the whole thing, but it, it worked. H- how do you spot those people in your business? So I think there are... Um some core tenets of, of individuals um, that I look for. Um, and there are things like 
um, proactiveness. Now, proactiveness means, you know, just before the, 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 the first interview that you're going to have, they follow up with you. Um, proactiveness means, you know, I, I have this rule where I don't give people the address of where the interview is. Like if you can't use Google and figure out where our office is, well, we've got a problem. Um, don't turn up. Um, you know, I think that's one thing. I think the second thing, um, I, I set these tests, you know, I look for what I call grit and grit is, um, the ability to persist through obstacles, you know, and I think everyone right now is experiencing that. You know, there's a lot of obstacles and a lot of obstacles coming. And I look, I, one of the questions I ask people is, what's the hardest job you've ever done? Now, if the hardest job you've ever done is, you know, oh, I worked at a cinema and punched tickets, it ain't that hard. Where if it's like, you know, I spent 10 hours a day every weekend while I was at university pushing lawnmowers, like that's a pretty tough job to do in the sun and all the leaves and all that. Like it's a pretty rough job, right? That says me says you've got grit. Um, and I think the last thing is and there's, there's a certain aspect where, you know, if, I, if you're going for a design job at Finder and, and I ask you, you know, hey, what do you do on your weekend? And you say, oh, you know, I love to cook muffins and I like to do gardening. Gardening is what I've always wanted to be. Like you're not really into designing. Whereas if you say like, hey, you know, I uh, I design uh, websites for charities on the weekend and I put up templates and I've got a little template portfolio I'd love to show you. That's someone who's passionate about designing and I want to work with that person. Right. I, I read a, a book recently, had a wonderful phrase in it, which is truth isn't necessarily the loudest person at the dinner party. So I love your philosophy of looking beyond like they do in Moneyball. So that you could have them the most charming person mm. and you go, yeah, but they like muffins and cooking. They ain't, they ain't right for the finder tribe. Mm. Yeah. So And people have not been hired, you know, because it's just not, you know, they could be great at designing, but they may not love to design. And that's a difference. You know, we want people to come in and love what they do each day. I think that's what in Moneyball, like, you know, there's that picture. I remember he, he threw a little weird, but he always got on base. You know, that's what he, he cared about. You know, he threw a little funny, sure, but whatever, that doesn't matter. You know, I think that's that's what you're looking for. You're looking for, in, 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 you know, uh, in New York when we set up the business there, it's so competitive to hire, right? And so you've got to find those Moneyball players. And that's what we found. There's, there's a group of collection of individuals that you wouldn't normally hire. And in, in fact, one time, I, I, one, of the, one of the crew members there who's still with us and he's, he's incredible, I actively said before the hiring, I said, I'm going to break all of our rules and who we hire and I'm going to hire the opposite. And everyone who is like normally in our thing, I said, no, because we want someone who's completely different is going to think differently while I'm not here. And and that, and that guy, he he still, he comes up with those ideas all, all day. Uh, an incredible individual. I, I love it. Now, now the film, uh, as you know, is, is based on the Michael Lewis book. Mm. Um, and, and the subtitle of that is The Art of Winning an Unfair game mm. so i wanted to ask you is when you're in a situation where the other guys have got more money mm. more power more cultural history and legacy how, how do you deal with that because it's unfair business you know it's, it's not a blank bit of paper yeah you know what i try and look for are two things one is i go to where things are new so wherever something is new and changing you have an equal uh, advantage because you're nimble and fast, whereas other companies could uh, tend to be slow and 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 well resourced but bulky. Um, and I think that's 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 one. I think that's why the Wright brothers. So when the Wright brothers were making their first airplane, um, there was actually a competitor, and no one remembers his name, but he was actually like extremely well funded. He was an an engineer. The Wright brothers were bicyclists, and they had a bicycle shop, right? But they were nimble, they were fast, and they were passionate, and they wanted to fly. Whereas he just wanted to build an airplane. That's a different yeah. thing. I think it's the same thing, right? So when you that's the first thing. Find something new and 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 stick to that. And then don't fight people head on. Go to somewhere um, and that's this is similar to that where it's new or where it's the zeitgeist. Like what's changing and moving and what's coming up, that's where you need to start. 
Yeah. And then you got to adapt backwards, right? So you go, okay, from here, you know, cryptocurrency was massive, right? So, and and we were like, well, we don't talk about cryptocurrency. Then we started, you know, well, let's talk about cryptocurrency. So we started comparing it and writing about it and we wrote a YouTube channel and those kind of things. And that made us relevant and um, gave us something to talk about. And so then we could compete. We could stand up and we could be noticed again and say, hey, here's that finder guys again. And they've got something new to talk about. So, Fred, for your second choice, we're going to move back in time to the 1980s, uh, and you have chosen the Covey classic, the 30 million selling bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, mm. of all the management self-improvement books out there, mm. why have you chosen that one? That book um, has profoundly affected me in you know, so many different ways. I don't know about the seventh one, uh, you know, the synergy. That one kind of confused me a little bit, but that's sort of, I think it's like when you wrap it all together. Um, you know, there are two two things um, that 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 really affected me. One was begin with the end in mind. Right. That idea just profoundly has affected me for every for everything because I start projects a lot, and when I start projects, I'm I've got to, you've got to start with the end. You go, where are we going? That's that's an important question to ask, right? And it's actually quite difficult to know. Um, and define that for a lot of for a lot of projects. And so when when I learned about that, I said, okay, well, I'm going to master the art of figuring out where we're trying to go, and then you can work backwards. Because there's brilliant people. See, once people, I think, um, get a clear goal and a clear problem, they're very good at solving it. Um, whereas when the problem is undefined, then people tend to not perform well. What my superpower is, is actually to be, I'm not actually that good in the environment when the problem's defined. I, I think I get bored and, you know, I'm probably on the spectrum somewhere. But when the problem is undefined, that's when I am exceptional. I can form a plan. I can form a strategy. I can find a goal in an undefined environment and space. And I think that book taught me that, right? It, it said, you know, and, and it resonated with me a lot. The other thing it did was it taught me about briefs and the critical nature of, of a brief. And, and I have this um, saying that always sticks in my mind is um, the quality of your brief determines the advertising you're going to get. And it's with anything, you know, the quality of your brief is going to determine the product you, you build. The quality of your brief is going to determine the podcast you make, whatever it may be. And just that idea from that book, I realized, oh, if we document it better up front, then you're going to get a better result afterwards. Ambiguity is the most ruthless killer of a great plan. And I think that that book, it, it just, it, it affected me a lot. There's obviously the circle of influence and circle of control. I think there were two other great concepts that what's in your ability to control, what can you influence? Otherwise, don't worry about those things. Who gave it to you? How did you come across it? Or well, how old were you? I think I was about max like 22. Um, it was after university. I remember reading it. I've read a lot a lot of books and I continue to read a lot of books. I'm reading um, The Trillion Dollar Coach right now, um, the new Ben Horowitz book about culture. Um, yeah, I've got a, a, quite a few on the on the go. Um but I, you know, I've read, actually read it twice, and one I actually got downloaded a um, a version of a workshop he gave. He was a very religious guy, apparently. Yeah, he's a seventh is it Seventh Adventist or no Latter Day Saints? I think yeah. But he Covey coined the phrase, which I will always love him for, uh, abundance mentality, mm. and that that uh, had a huge impact on me. Where you go, the other guy hasn't got to lose. It's, it's not about crushing someone else. And, and I wanted to ask you, is, does that come naturally to you or is that something that you have to work on? So when you're making, I mean, you've been a huge success. Do you define that or, or is your natural default, I've got to kill those other bastards or is it I'm going to provide value to you know, consumers? So I think in the past, in the beginning, I will confess, I, I did start with a, a killer mindset, um, no doubt about it. Um, and I think that helped to propel us. And... Uh, you know, with you know, there is a certain size of a market that we've gotten to as well, and that's challenging. Then you you know, yes, there's abundance, 
yes, we're going to keep promoting ourselves and keep working to the customer and delivering better and better value to them. But also I think there is an element to, in, particularly in Australia, it's actually quite a, it's, it's relatively a small market. And then you, you know, it kind of gets to the point where yes, you can win, win, but it might be just win and not lose, but you know, even if that makes sense. Sure. Um, so I, you know, I, I love the win-win and I do try to go for win-win as best I can. I think that's what he, he talks about. But it's not always possible, um, unfortunately. And But I always try and as best I can, you know, try and figure out a way. I definitely think, you know, even today I'm motivated. I have um, uh, one of, um, I'll confess this here, this is very vulnerable, but I have one of, um, actually I have uh, three of our, one of our big competitors merchandise on my desk and it reminds me every day that they are there. Yeah. Um, and that we will, like, I am definitely aware of what who they are, but I'm setting that benchmark to remind myself to always keep going. Love it. Um, we're going to go back even further in time to the 60s for your third choice on Five My Life. You've chosen the opening track of the Abbey Road Beatles album, uh, Come Together. Why? Tell me a story, mate. I asked my family one day, I said, hey, what's the song that um, reminds you of me? And um, on their own, they came, they said, they said, come together by the Beatles. And, and this is your, your parents or your children or both? Uh, my, so my parents and my sisters at the time. Right. And I said, why is that? And my mum said, well, there's a line, you know, got to be good looking because you're so hard to see. And I said, oh, that's, I don't quite understand that. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I think over over time, even when I hear the song again, I, I feel like that song talks to my energy and I don't know why, it just in a deeper profound, it vibrates my electrons or something in a, just a, a way where I'm, extremely connected to the feeling of that song. And I think it's, um, there's another song by Tame Impala recently. Um, I think it's called Elephant and it's it's kind of similar um, in some small ways, but the, you know, and it has the same attitude. It's like, I'm just going to put myself out there, you know, and, and, and I feel this is real, just, I'm just going to do it. You know, I don't really care what, I'm just, this is what I want to do and I'm going to put it out there. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. And that's how I feel from that that song. I don't know. There's probably, the, none of the words necessarily all connect to that. And it's probably a different story in that song. But that's what it ignites in me. And I think that's all that really matters. So why did you ask your family about what song? So it's a great question. I remember in the moment I wanted to know what reminded me of uh, for them like what, what what was the song that reminded um, them of me and the reason why this is a, it's pretty intense and I think about it is I thought so again beginning with the end in mind I thought okay if I was gonna have a funeral <laughs> what what song would they play and that's a pretty intense thought, right? And I yeah. was thinking like, well, I want to know because I'm not going to be able to hear it. And I also thought from that, I'm on a constant journey of learning about myself. And I think you can learn a lot when someone tells you a song that reminds you about them. I think it it gives you a like a lateral uh, um, angle towards seeing something about yourself that you don't normally actually see and don't realize. And I, I think there's a constant awareness that you need to find out about yourself. And I wanted to ask them, they're very close to me, what, you know, if, if basically I was saying, if I was going to die, what song would you play? Um, but I can't say that, right? But you can ask them what it reminds you. And I think that's where it started from. And I think where that comes from is I have a deep passion. So people ask you what drives you. And one of the things that drives me is legacy. Um, to leave something that people remember. And it goes on and on and on. Not like giving someone a glass of water, but give someone a fountain or a well. And hopefully 
in some small way, you know, with Finder that might might be part of it and helping people, you know, make better decisions so they, they live just a little bit of a, of a better life. Do you, do you think about death a lot? You know, I, I think I do. <laughs> um, I have a reminder each month in my calendar, a recurring reminder that says Memento Mori. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure you know we are brothers from another mother. Oh, right. oh yeah, okay. So Stoics. Um, so the gladiators used to have a little, apparently a little kid that used to walk behind them and remind them, memento mori, you know, behind them, and the generals and things like that. And so I think that connection back to asking yourself, if I was going to die today or tomorrow, how would I feel about that? And that just tech checks in with myself and said, you know, am I doing the things that I love? Am I aligned to, um, you know, myself and my family and um, my friends and my partner? And you know, I think that's an important question to ask yourself. And if you feel that you aren't for several days in a row, that's normally when I make a change. Are you a religious man? I'm not. Um, that's not to say, but I I have also been discovering my connection to source. And that's a very um, unusual word to use, but I, I didn't have a, I didn't go to, you know, church. I, I don't have any, uh, or, you know, synagogue or anything. I just don't, just, we just didn't do that in my family. Didn't go to a religious school. Um, so I never really understood that terribly well. And, um, and so I don't pr- profess that I can. Although I never really had a, you know, I've only just sort of just started to discover my source of power and my energy. Um, and I'm getting very close to that. And uh, just this is being very vulnerable, but it's it's actually what I'm working on right now. Um, so I have an emotional coach that I've been working with for five years. And I said I was, a you know, maybe so when I was 34, I was actually quite young of mind, if that makes sense. And I couldn't talk about a lot of topics and I was not authentically myself. I hadn't matured a lot. I was kind of a kid in an, in an adult's body. And this coach has challenged me on this and it's actually brought me on a big journey of cleaning up a lot of stuff. And now I'm prepared and ready to understand where is my source of power? What is my... And it connects to the word, word, to the word faith. Faith is another big word. I think that's wh- where you're sort of going with that. Where do I get my faith from? What do I believe in? Um, where is my connection to source? And and those things I am currently working on. I, I really appreciate you being so honest and authentic uh, on Five My Life, mate. It's it's wonderful hearing you. Talk uh, to me a bit about your family, as mm. in your family, not your mum and dad, which we'll come on to later. Mm. Uh, is when you say just do it, is that how you approach your personal life as well as your business life, or is it just business, just personal? So when I so the third value of Finder is go live, and I'm definitely and probably a physical manifestation of that. Um, when it comes to um, you know doing something new, doing something different, you know I love those things, and I have two little girls. I, I, I used to be married. Um, I have a great ex-wife, and I have a great partner um, today, um, and. Um, we all went traveling together recently, so we went skiing. But, you know, I think... Uh, it's an uh, ex-wife, current wife, and two daughters. Right. Cool. I love it. And, and was that a, a screaming disaster or was that fun? So I, I I thought I was worried and, you know, as you should be. But then for some reason I wasn't, like, I was thinking I was nervous, not anxious. I think it's a big difference there. So, so they got on really well and left you alone? No, <laughs> they didn't get on really well. I just got a lot of, like, messages from each and I worked through that, but... Actually, I empathize with them. They feel uncomfortable. And I feel it was my role to, to help them feel comfortable. And then we had a great time. You know, oh. we, we, we had a great time. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I have a great, I, I, as, as, you know, my ex-wife's great. She's, she's, um, uh, she's an amazing woman. She's, you know, so is my current partner. And, and I, no harm, no foul. I don't feel any animosity at all. I feel... You know, we went we went to Sri Lanka before that with uh, you know all together, and I thought, hey, you know, there's no need. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I, you were married before. Let's find the good parts. 
I love it. So you're, you're being true to how that song speaks to you. You, you mentioned that there might be another story behind the song. Do, mm. do, do you know how it was um, created? I'd love to tell you. The, the, the Come Together one? I, I, I don't know. I would love to hear it. So, so John Lennon was asked by Timothy Leary, you know the, the turn on, tune in, drop out drug? Uh, LSD. Ca- yeah, yeah, him. He was, uh, he was campaigning against Ronald Reagan to be the governor of California. And he met Lennon at the peace, you know, sleep in, the love in, and said, mate, would you write my campaign song? Wow. Wow, wow, yeah. There wow. you go. I, I, this is just, you're welcome. There you go. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll listen to that differently. For your fourth choice on Five My Life, you have chosen New York City. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your story behind that, Fred. So I... First went to New York City in 2015. Ah, recently. Okay. Um, that was the first time I ever went. And I'd never been. And when I got there, I instantly leveled up at least two to three points of energy. Now, you know, not many cities do that to you, right? London and and you're pretty energetic anyway. I'm a relatively, <laughs> I'm a, yeah, I'm a relatively energetic kind of guy. Um, but this city took me up, yeah, two to three points. And people said to me afterwards, you know, for that's a city for you. Oh, there's a lot of people who it's not for, but that is a city for you. And I get sad leaving New York City, even though it's, you know, it's, it's having some challenges right now. But there's a something about New York, and it was, it was a story um, this lady told me once. She said, I said, does it get cold here? She goes, yeah. She goes, does it snow? She goes, yeah. You know, and we were setting up an office, and it was, you know, I, was like, I was like, oh, okay. I go, does, do people, what do they do then? She goes, they go to work, Fred. I said, what? She said, yeah, a storm's not going to stop a New Yorker going to work. And I was like, wow. You know, I just felt they had them see the, you know, they wear the ski masks and they wear like, you know, the Canada goose and they're just trudging through the blizzard. And I love just, I was like, wow, that is another level. Would you live there? It sounds like you should be living in the East Village. I would love to, um, I, but my, my, my two little girls are here. I try and, I have a visa for the, for the US, so oh, it's not going to help me right now. But um, I would... Love to, but, you know, circumstances don't allow me to do that. So, favourite New York museum? Uh, a confession, the Frick. Have you been to the Frick? I, I, I don't think I have. I've, 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 so, so, let me just give you context. I, unfortunately, have, you know, I've never been up the Empire State Building. I only just went to the Central Park recently. The High Line? Tell me you've done the High Line. Uh, I've walked the High Line, yep. yeah. Okay. Um, I just... I'm there for a different reason. You know, I'm there to, to work. And so, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you should go to this restaurant. And I go, yeah. So when you work there, you so there's two sort of parts. There's like, there's the tourist part, the traveler, you know, and then there's the, I, I call it the working man's restaurant. So the restaurants I go to, you're not going to find in a book or anything. They're the ones, they're the, right. like the, you know, the $3 bagel and coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's the, it's the, you know, here's the giant sandwich for 10 bucks. You know, those are there. You just, it's hard to see. Here's the, here's the dumpling place with $2 dumplings that are the size, size of your fists, you know. that's. And so I, I think I just have a different aspect to it. And But working in there and living there, it, it, it unfortunately, I, I burnt out. Actually, quite a few times. And it, it, when you were in New York? Yeah, working there. I, no, I did it on purpose, right? I, I see it as a tactic. You know, if you're really in flow, you should just carry on until you... Because getting into flow is hard. But once you are in flow, I think just push it all the way. Because those moments come and go. You know, memento mori. Um, I, I love seeing you light up when you talk about New York. It, I, mean, I mean, all my guests obviously put lots of thought into their choices, but it's just wonderful hearing you chat about your place with such love and passion. When I get stale, 
and I find myself repeating myself, then I throw myself back into New York to level up again. It's it just it it breaks you. It, every time it breaks me, and then I get broken down, and then I rebuild myself up, and then I'm like, and I, like I'm a phoenix. I, I I come back again stronger. Total change of pace for your fifth choice, uh, I imagine, because you have chosen your grandfather's toaster. I love it. We've gone from the capitalist uh, centre of the world to your granddaddy's toaster. Uh, I can't wait to hear the story behind that. What's that about? So my my grandfather was a highly frugal man um, and a great man. Um, built a lot, 500 factories out in Blacktown in Sydney here, which is, you know, not an easy, with bricks, you know, not cement, you know, different, different, different times, right? And he came from very little and there's a difference between frugality for frugality's sake and value. Now, when my father, grandfather passed away, everyone went into his house and they went and got stuff because they were selling the house. And so we went for the paintings and all sorts of things and, you know, just super valuable stuff. I walked in, walked under the stairs and picked up what was not the current toaster, but his one that he had kept in a box that was brand new. So my grandfather in 1987, and the, the receipt's still in it, bought three of these toasters. <laughs> now, the beauty in this toaster is that it is purely mechanical and it was built here um, in Australia, it's actually a, a work before electronics. And the toaster actually, the toast goes down by itself and comes up by itself. Now, now if you think about that from an electronics perspective, you, you measure the temperature and those kind of things, but it wasn't done with electronics. It was done with, with like actual mechanical pieces. So it had to figure out some way of actually operating. And so I think it's an actual piece of engineering brilliance that, uh, you know, people have come together and made. And so I, I look at it like that. The second part, it says to me, here is my grandfather identifying value and beauty in something quite simple, but actually extremely beautiful. Um, and then it reminds me of him in terms of um, thinking value and not just frugality. And was he the most influential family relationship you had or would that be your mum or your dad or... You know, my grandfather, I think I, I didn't spend, I, I spent quite a lot of time with him, but I would, he would, I would go on journeys with him. My grandfather was a quiet, was a quiet, kind of quiet guy, but you'd go and do stuff. So one day I went out with him and saw his factories, you know, and I, I was a, I was, you know, nine years old, 10 years old. And I didn't know what that meant. And we stopped by the side of the road and he gave me a tuna sandwich and I didn't like tuna, but I ate it anyway. And, um, but I realized that he built things and it, and it was good to build things and that you can, um, enterprise on your own and, and see entrepreneurialism when I was 20, now that's the two thousands, um, when I was finishing schools, the late nineties, it wasn't very cool. It wasn't a thing you did. No one, no one went to like, you know, entrepreneur stuff and that wasn't a thing. And, but when I saw what he had done, it really affected me. And I realized you can do stuff on your own. You can be independent. And I think my, my grandparents, other grandparents as well, they were very frugal as well. And they, they sort of encouraged me. And they, again, they came from um, a very tough time in Austria during the second world war, a, a brutal time. And so they lived and they showed me another way to live extremely frugally. Um, I'd, I'd I, I don't know how my grandmother survived, but she she somehow did. Um, you know, I think my mum probably would be more influential. She again is a an ophthalmologist, and so just to give you context, thirty years ago and still today, ophthalmology unfortunately is a very um, misogynistic. Field. This is eyes, right? Yeah, eyes. Yeah. So eyes in Australia, the industry ophthalmology is run as a boys' club. And, uh, and and she has done put up with some of the you know most brutal things I've the story she tells me I don't, I, I don't think I can repeat and even today there is some you know the the the, the ophthalmology industry um, and the people who run it are not 
they're not very favorable to um, to women, unfortunately. And and I see her as someone who has struggled through that, and um, I find that inspiring. Yeah, and, and um, obviously affects how you treat uh, your employees and how you hire. Hundred percent. You know, I I don't even. Someone said to me once. They said, "Oh, Fred, we're in New York, and there were twelve people around." And I said, "Fred, why do we have so many? Why do you always hire more women than men?" And I looked up and I was like, "There are more women than men here." <laughs> you know, it's the best person for the best job. I believe in hierarchies of competence. Yeah. You know, that's that's it, and it's a it's a hard line with me. It's been wonderful to hear your stories, uh, Fred. I'm going to go to my sixth traditional question. Who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Wow. Um, I I don't know. Some of the people are from America. I don't know if it's possible or not. Um, if they're alive, we get them. I think Ben Horowitz is incredible. I love Ben Horowitz. And, and why would you want to hear him? He has a very alternative mind. He's a great visionary. Um, he tells it as it is, raw. I think Peter Thiel, he's amazing as well. Extremely contrarian. Would be very interesting to hear his views right now. Right, okay. Well, they, those are two really good suggestions and we will follow them up. Fred, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your choices. Thanks very much. Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 